Hello, my name is Jeremy Woodley. I am Sales and Marketing Director of the Fry Group and I'm a Chartered and Certified Financial Planner. What we'd like to do today is spend 20 minutes or so going through some of the common solutions that we use with clients and just some of the problems that we come across. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, clearly, um, with quite a few of you on the line, if you all had questions, we wouldn't get to them all. Uh, so we'll probably handle two or three and then we'll come back to you uh, with individual answers. They will be fairly generic in nature and shouldn't be seen to be advice. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So what should have happened is you should now be seeing the slides. Um, so what what's the scale of the issue? You know, where do we get to with this problem? Well, ultimately, you, you know, in tax year 15, 16, which is where we have the latest figures for, HMRC collected 4.6 billion uh, in revenue on inheritance tax. So not something they're going to get rid of lightly. Um, you know, in, by 2020, they're predicting that one in 10 estates uh, will have this issue or be of a value that would uh, attract inheritance tax. And as you can see, you know, the numbers have doubled, you know, so far this decade, pretty much in the number of estates that have been caught by inheritance tax. So what can we do to think about, look at uh, some of the simple ways of um, uh, solving inheritance tax. Well, uh, the middle picture doesn't mean that I think you ought to go and buy an ocean liner. Um, it just means spend it. Um, clearly, there's always that argument about you don't know how much you'll need yourselves, but in essence, uh, spending the money, uh, even spending the money on your relatives uh, is a pretty good way to solve your inheritance tax problem. Um, in the top left, there's a picture of a gift. Now, clearly, gifting uh, is quite key, and there's a few key things that you ought to remember around that. Is there is a large gifts allowance every year of three thousand uh, pounds, and a small gifts allowance of two hundred and fifty. You can't give the small gifts, and you can give any many of any number of small gifts as you want, uh, but you can't give small gifts to the same person you gave the large gift to. Um, and probably what's more powerful, I would suggest, is something called gifts out of income. If, for instance, you have a fairly high level of income coming in, um, and that's income from pensions, etc., and a, a reasonable level of disposable income, you could start to gift your disposable income. Um, that can be any amount. It has to be regular though, so clients tend to hit perhaps birthdays or Christmas. Um, and as long as you keep a note and you can give away um, anything that you want, as long as you don't jeopardize your own standard of living. A key point with that really is please just make sure you leave a note somewhere for your executors to confirm that's what you've done. Um, and yeah, the charity tin. Uh, gifts to charity are exempt uh, from inheritance tax, and funnily enough, so are gifts to political parties. So before we go on and talk about um, the different types of things we can do, then I would just say that inheritance tax or mitigation of inheritance tax um, you know, all the things we're going to talk about um, are in HMRC legislation. There's nothing aggressive here um, and nothing that puts you on the front of a national newspaper. Um, a discounted gift trust, as you can see on the slide, as it's titled, has been around certainly for the last 20 odd years that I've been in financial planning um, and is a really common tool. So when you look at gifting or you look at inheritance tax planning, chances are you're giving up one thing or another. You're either giving up income 
or you're giving up access to capital. And when we look at instruments that help over a seven year period, uh, that's certainly the case. So here we're looking at something called a discounted gift trust. And I, I guess as the name implies, you make a gift into a trust. And if we suggest that that's a hundred thousand pounds, just to make the maths easy. So you gift a hundred thousand pounds and HMRC will instantly give you a discount on that gift. What they'll do is they'll look at your age, they'll look at how much income you, they think you'll take over the remainder of your lifetime and discount the gift accordingly. So you end up with an immediate saving to inheritance tax. Now that really works on the basis that if you were going to take 5% a year, they thought you had 10 years, um, that's 5 times 10 is 50. So therefore then you end up with a 50% discount on the gift. So if it's 100,000 pounds, 50,000 has instantly left your estate and 50,000 you're going to have to wait the seven years to fall outside of your estate. Now, what you can have as well with this and what you would have with this is you can have the income from this trust for the remainder of your days. So you're okay, you give up access to capital, but you get to receive the income on an ongoing basis. The next uh, vehicle here is um, something that gives you a bit more flexibility than that in that it uh, is effectively a sequence of policies that are written with consecutive maturity years. So again, if we take our £100,000, you perhaps split that into 10. So you end up with £10,000 in each of the policies or the segments labelled you know, 1 to 10. And at the end of the first year, policy 1 matures and you get this opportunity. You get the opportunity of, do you want the money back? The, 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 the amount of that maturity, so perhaps £10,000, or do you want to roll it to the end? And that becomes policy number 11. And that can continue on a sort of a continuous loop. So every year you get asked, do I want the policy maturity? And if I don't, um, I'll roll it to the bottom. And that once that's happened seven times, so you're in year eight, uh, the policy or the trust is completely outside of your estate. Um, I think the important thing to realize with both this and a discounted gift trust is you don't have to take any more risk than you're comfortable with. So you could actually pick up part of an existing portfolio and drop it into one of these structures and you're not taking any further risk. You've just put some rules and a few constraints around how you can access that capital. Uh, the next type of solution uh, we'd like to show you is a gift and loan trust. Again, been around for decades. You make a very small gift into a trust, and so perhaps £10. Uh, you then loan it uh, a big lump of money, so perhaps your £100,000. And then right from the beginning, any growth on that loan is outside of your estate. And if you really wanted to, you could have the money back from the loan at any point in time. That's not an issue. But you really need quite a long period of time to make this quite effective because you want the growth part that you're earning on the loan um, to become larger and larger and larger. So that's going to need a reasonable period of time to make that happen. I would say just at this point, if anyone's frantically scribbling and making notes, uh, there will be um, a note of a guide that we have that you can download that covers all of the things that we're talking about today, but I'll explain that at the end. The next thing to look at is when you consider, okay, so there were things that could get money outside of your estate in seven years, and we now need to have a look at what we can do for two years. So. Two years uh, is something using uh, business relief. Now, business relief came about in the mid 70s when small businesses were having to be sold to pay death duties 
and the government wanted to invent something to assist small businesses in basically keeping going. So if you were a small enough business, you qualified for something called business, what used to be called business property relief, it's now called business relief, and that is exempt as long as you hold the shares at your date of death if you've held them for two years. So as with all things, um, a bit of a market sprang up trying to make use of that rule. And one of the key places is on the alternative investment market or the AIM market. So on here, you get businesses of varying sizes, but who want to operate on an exchange with a lower level of regulation than the main uh, exchange or the sort of, you know, than the London Stock Exchange. And some of these businesses qualify for business relief. So the likes of Port Merion, which is a China business, Finsbury Food, a pretty big food um, manufacturer, and YouGov, the polling uh, people. So names that you could very well have heard of. Um, it's quite key in that market, though, that the you can't just go to AIM and buy a range of shares because some do qualify for business relief and some don't, um, which is why when we do it, we use a discretionary fund manager to do that job for our clients. Um, what there also is, is something called enterprise investment schemes. Now these have been around again for a good few years and these are basically single companies in certain underlying trades. So perhaps media, if you looked, uh, some big films uh, have been made uh, using EIS money, um, you know, programs on BBC and ITV, uh, same sort of thing. Uh, renewables, so solar panels in all those fields and that sort of energy type of thing. And more recently, since the banking crisis, some providers have moved into the space that the banks left in the lending. Um, Again, with both of these, you do have to realize that you are perhaps dealing in a lighter regulated business or a smaller business. So liquidity becomes a big risk. And, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, these are up at nine and 10. So we wouldn't suggest this was the majority of a client's portfolio, but, you know, it could certainly form a small part. The advantage with enterprise investment schemes, though, is you can also qualify for income tax relief, uh, up to 30% of your contribution. So for some clients, that fits uh, quite nicely. Um, but again, you know, you do have to take on board the risk, and you do get business relief. But again, as long as you've held the investment for two years and at the date of death. Um, slightly bizarrely, perhaps for an inheritance tax presentation, um, there is a part on pensions. Now, uh, pensions since April 2015 became a, a, well, about the best inheritance tax tool that exists. So here you've got a vehicle that's completely outside of your estate and um, you can leave it to whoever you want and they have pretty much instant access to those funds. So since 2015, when uh, George Osborne as Chancellor stood up and changed all the pension rules, uh, death benefits under pensions are far better. Um, and this is really applying to those people, not with final salary schemes, but with uh, money purchase schemes or personal pensions, um, something like that. If the individual also is under the age of 75, uh, when they pass away, um, it's actually completely tax free. Uh, for the beneficiaries, um, and it works better if no benefits have been drawn from the pension from a tax perspective. Um, what I would say, though, is it's certainly a consideration. If you have a pot, a pension pot that you're drawing down on and significant other assets, it would certainly be perhaps a suggestion to turn off the pension income and spend your other assets, um, as this is such a good inheritance tax tool. Okay, so property. Okay, it's always been a problem. Uh, I don't yet know of any scheme that's ever 
not been defeated. If somebody tells you they've got a really clever scheme to remove your main residence from the, your estate, um, I think I'd ask them to prove it uh, with council's opinion and some things that have actually happened. Because as far as we're aware, there isn't anything. Um, the, the simplest way to fix the problem of a main residence is actually probably to give it to probably your children and then pay a rent. Now the difficulty with that is it has to be a fair market rent uh, and I'm yet to find any parent that's willing to pay their children rent. So, so what has happened? Well, we now have something called a property nil rate band and a property nil rate band first came about as a consequence of politics meeting financial planning. Um, it was a manifesto pledge of the Tories back, um, I guess, what would it be, seven or eight years ago now? Um, and it takes that long to get from sort of a thought to actual legislation. So finally this year, starting in April, we now have a property nil rate band. Uh, it goes up from 100,000 this year to 125 next year, 150 a year after, 175 the year after that. So the manifesto pledge was to make estates over a million pound uh, pay inheritance tax. So by the time we get to tax year 2021, you would potentially have 175,000 pounds worth of property nil rate band, 325,000 pounds worth of a personal nil rate band. So you add the two together, you get half a million pounds. So husband and wife or civil partnership and so for two people, you get a million pounds. Now why they couldn't have made uh, your nil rate band half a million pounds, I don't know, um, but that's the way they've done it. Now, but there are some issues with the property nil rate band. Now that's mainly to do with uh, the property has to be given to a direct descendant. We have to make absolutely sure that um, it, it, um, it doesn't have to be claimed. It's an, actually an allowance. So your executors should be aware of you having held property. Now, it, that doesn't count for buy to let properties. You actually have to have lived in it. And as I say, it has to go to a direct dependent. Um, and there are some downsizing rules. So assuming that you've held property in excess, in excess of the property nil rate band, uh, at some point in the past, you can claim uh, the property nil rate band. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it, but it, well, I guess the point I'm trying to make there is you don't have to be trapped in a building that you don't want to be trapped in. Uh, you can downsize and still claim the allowance. So, um, another interesting point is, um, you know, now I would have thought hopefully most people um, listening in have done a will, um, that's quite common. I think what's least less common, um, certainly according to some recent statistics that we saw in a survey, um, this was a survey done here in the UK by a firm of lawyers, um, and so 90% of people had done their will, 70% um, of people were concerned with getting old and potentially dementia or not being able to manage their affairs and these sorts of things. And of those though, the bit that surprised me the most was only 5% had done a lasting power of attorney. Now admittedly, powers of attorney got a lot more complicated about seven years ago. They actually went from literally one, two sides of A4 to about a 27 page document. Um, but they do include a uh, financial section and a health and welfare section. Um, so they are a lot more inclusive. Uh, as I'm sure you would imagine, you know, we have an estates team, we can write wills and do lasting powers of attorney. Uh, and I'm sure some of my colleagues would be more than happy to assist you with this. I would though say um, an old enduring power of attorney, 
up until the point that these were changed are still valid but you don't have the ability in the old style document it really only covered your finances and nothing else so uh, I'm going to try and take some questions um, from the list um, I can see um, what uh, what I would, uh, let's have a look and see if we can, okay, so uh, out of my list of questions, I can see a question about the changes to domicile rules, um, so what actually happened there? Well, um, government was looking uh, last year at uh, and announced in a budget beginning of this year, changes to domicile rules that had been consulted on for a period of time. This was the idea of the people that are in the UK for long, considerable periods of time become UK domiciled for all taxes, and that included inheritance tax. Uh, didn't used to be the case. Um, you used to be able to have capital gains tax and income tax done differently to inheritance tax, but that's no longer going to be the case. Uh, slight blemish, I suppose, is that those rules are supposed to come in from April 17. Uh, we then had a general election, so we didn't get a finance act. In fact, we still haven't got a Finance Act 2017. Um, and uh, but the rules, when they look like they are, when they do come in, will actually come in retrospectively to April 17. And what does that actually mean? Well, it basically means if you think you're non-domiciled and residing in the UK, um, you might not be. If you think you've done inheritance tax planning when you were a non-domicile, um, something called your domicile of origin kicks back in. Um, which means we used to do planning through things called excluded property trusts. Uh, they um, are unlikely to work now, depending on your circumstances. So if you were born in the UK, you were overseas, you managed to change your domicile, you did some inheritance tax planning, and you've come back, chances are um, that planning now would fail. Um, so quite key if you've done that. So that was changes to domicile. There's a question on LPAs from Terry, um, and that's to do with, do you have to do financial and health and welfare at the same time? No, you don't. Um, I know there's a cost issue. Um, these things aren't cheap, but it's a damn sight cheaper than getting involved with the court of protection and having to sort out uh, a mess afterwards. So I would suggest that you did do financial and health and welfare. Um, interestingly enough, anecdotally, uh, talking to one of my um, estates team the other day, um, clients in Wiltshire and clients in Suffolk had both actually had the question asked by a paramedic when they were picking up a nearest and dearest, um, have they done their health and welfare lasting power of attorney? So clearly the paramedics have even been trained to ask this question uh, because ultimately they know it's an instrument of the court and they have to listen to the person that um, is going to be the attorney at that point. So uh, I would suggest um, they're becoming more and more important. And uh, finally, because conscious we said this wasn't going to last uh, too long, um, question from Mary on a residential nil rate band. Um, yeah, I mean, no, no, you don't have to put it in your will. Um, you don't have to change the will to make reference to the residential, residential nil rate band. It is um, in there. It's an allowance that your executors should just claim. Um, so that's fine. You don't have to change your will. And something else that came up the other day in Scotland, uh, you do need to make sure, though, that you're both on the deed of the property. Um, depending on what was going to happen in a will, uh, sometimes one person's on the on the property and not the other person. Uh, we would suggest that just to make life simpler, it's probably best that somebody owns property in their name that they have lived in, um, and that way there should be no confusion about claiming the allowance. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for uh, 
uh, listening and watching. Uh, as I say, uh, we do have an inheritance tax guide, which you can download from our website. The website is in the contact details we will put up uh, in one second. Uh, but generally, thank you very much.